Hello and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Now, I don't know where you're from, but where I'm from, America, healthcare is a very controversial issue. A few days ago, I was talking to a coworker from, he's originally from the country Spain, and he was saying that in, in Spain, the day you're born, you have healthcare. That's just a law in that country. And the healthcare policy that you have is a pretty good one. So the day you're born, you have medical insurance. It's very simple, it's a law there. <laughs> and he was saying how in most other countries in Europe, that's how it is. It's straightforward, you are automatically insured with a pretty good healthcare policy from the day you're born. It's not like that here in America, right? It's very complicated. And he really didn't get it. He, he was just like, I don't understand. Why does it have to be so complicated in this country? Well, to answer that question, why is healthcare such a controversial, complex issue? That's a hard question to answer. But let me tell you something. There's a, a good book out there right now that breaks it down for you really well. And that book is America's Bitter Pill by Stephen Brill. This book breaks it down. It goes over the complexities and the controversies and all the politics and economics that goes into the American healthcare system. And it does this by focusing on the Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare. Now there's a lot of people out there who really like Obamacare. And then there's a lot of people out there who really hate Obamacare. <laughs> but a lot of people really don't understand the Affordable Care Act in its entirety, like how it started, what it took to get it into law, the ins and outs of it. A lot of people don't understand it full circle. And this book breaks it down for you. But let me tell you something, it is very complicated, that's for sure. And my hat's off to Stephen Brill for writing this book because man, it, it is some really complex politics and economics going on behind the healthcare system in general. Let me read you this quote right here. So Stephen Brill, he's able to get a written interview with the president. He sent some questions to the president to answer. And here's one of the questions. This is question number 11. How would you explain to a sixth or seventh grade class the process that led to the passage of Obamacare, the negotiations with various industry sectors, the lack of bipartisanship, the sheer complexity and length of the statute? The president's answer, declined to answer. <laughs> the reason why I think he declined to answer because it's just, you can't do it. You can't give an easy enough explanation for a sixth or seventh grade class to understand. <laughs> you really can't. I gotta tell you, man, I was reading this book and I might as well be reading like Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason or Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit or John Paul Sartre's Being in Nothingness. You know, I might as well because the politics and the economics that are tied within the healthcare system in America are incredibly complicated I mean, there are parts of this book where I had to just reread, basically, because there's just so much stuff going on in terms of the inner workings involved. I mean, thank goodness the thing has an index, right? You know, thank goodness that I could go back and look up stuff, right? I mean, this is a great resource if you're trying to understand healthcare in America. This is an amazing resource. But the real interesting part about this book is that the author, Stephen Brill, who was doing research on healthcare in America. At the tail end of it, when he was almost finishing up the book, he had a medical checkup and he, the doctor found this, what's called an aortic aneurysm, which had the possibility of rupturing or exploding that would kill him before he would be able to go to the emergency room of a hospital, right? So he had to hurry up and get heart surgery, a serious operation to correct that. And for him, that brought everything to perspective. All of what he was researching, it made it personal. And for me, that's how, how the book gets really interesting. Let me read you this quote. This is what makes healthcare and dealing with healthcare costs so different, so hard. It's what makes the Obamacare story so full of twists and turns, so dramatic, because the politics are so treacherous. People care about their health a lot more than they care about healthcare policies or economics. That's what I learned the night I was terrified by my own heartbeat and in the days after when I would have paid anything for a cough suppressant to avoid those blackouts. It's not that this makes prices or policies allowing indeed encouraging, 
runaway costs unimportant? Hardly. My time on the gurney notwithstanding, I believe everything I have written and will write about the toxicity of our profiteer dominated healthcare system. But now I also understand firsthand the meaning of what the caregivers who work in that system do every day. They do achieve amazing things. And when it's your life or your child's life or your mother's life on the receiving end of those amazing things, there's no such thing as a runaway cost. You'll pay anything. If you don't have the money, you'll borrow at any mortgage rate or from any payday lender to come up with the cash. Which is why 60% of nearly 1 million personal bankruptcies filed in the United States last year resulted from medical bills. So a lot of things are mentioned there, right? Of course, if you're facing a life-threatening illness where you can be saved through some sort of amazing operation or medical procedure, yet expensive, that doesn't matter. Like at that moment, it is highly likely you're gonna pay that price, whatever it is, not just to save yourself, which is a strong drive altogether, but also because maybe your family is involved, you know, maybe you're married or maybe you're, you have dependents who are depending on you and you're worried about all that. He also mentions that, you know, it's not the, the caregivers that are the culprits. They're not the ones that are doing the bad things. They're, they're doing the amazing things. The problem is the system. The system itself is broken. That's the issue. Later in the book, he interviews various families. Here's a quote from the book about a family he's interviewing. The family's first bill for $348,000, which arrived when Stephen got home from Seton Medical Center in Daly City, California, was full of all the usual charge master profit grabs, $24 each for 19 niacin pills that are sold in drugstores for about a nickel apiece, and for boxes of sterile gauze pads available on Amazon for $5.38 each for $77 a box. None of that was considered part of what was provided in return for Seton Medical Center's facility charge for two days in the intensive care unit at $13,225 a day, 12 days in the critical care unit at $7,315 a day, and one day in a standard room. The room charges totaled $120,116 over 15 days. There was also $20,886,000 for CT scans and $24,251 for lab work. I asked Alice how she felt about the obvious overcharges for items like gauze pads. Are you kidding? She responded. I'm dealing with a husband who had just been told he has stage 4 cancer. That's all I could focus on. You think I looked at the items on the bills? I just looked at the total. Again, that's what we're dealing with. You know, somebody's facing a life-threatening illness. Your loved ones are going to do whatever. You know, it's just a drive that we have as human beings. We're not focused on those prices. And the healthcare system takes advantage of that, that drive. That's how the healthcare system overcharges so much for all these items that could be purchased cheaply, really. And it, you know, puts people in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Now, the Affordable Care Act actually did provide coverage for a lot of people like this family to be able to deal with these overcharges. Check out this quote. Obamacare gave millions of Americans access to affordable health care, or at least protection against not being able to pay for a catastrophic illness or being bankrupt by the bills. Now everyone has access to insurance and subsidies to help pay for it. That is a milestone toward erasing a national disgrace. But the new law hasn't come close to making health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs low enough so that health care is truly affordable to everyone, let alone affordable to the degree that it is in every other developed country. More important, it hasn't done much to fix the health care system. It's just stuffing more people into the, the jalopy, which is only going to make the jalopy more expensive to keep running. Now, the cool thing about Stephen Brill is that he does a really good job breaking down the problem, giving you uh, an excellent analysis and a journalistic view of what's going on, very heavily researched. But on top of that, his personal experience with his serious operation and all the bills that went with that, <laughs> it drove him to try and figure out a solution to this problem himself. And the solution he offers to fix the healthcare system 
It's an interesting one, and it's one that's definitely worth pursuing. He noticed that in his research, he noticed that a few hospitals that have been successful have also become an insurer. Like somebody that goes to a hospital can get insured by that hospital. And the author, Stephen Brill, feels this is a great way to help control the costs of healthcare. Uh, cut out that middleman, cut out the insurance companies, and let hospitals also be insurance companies themselves. So patients of hospitals will be insured by those hospitals. They'll have policies under those hospitals. He feels that will drive hospitals to be more competitive to offer better health care. And it'll also be easier to regulate because there's less people involved, basically. It's not, it's, you know, it's not that middleman, that insurance company. But then with adopting that solution, what's to stop hospitals and other healthcare providers from taking advantage of the system themselves, right? So he says on top of that, you have high regulations as well. This is what he says. The first regulation would require that any market have at least two of these big fully integrated provider insurance company players. Meaning you don't have just one hospital uh, provider for all people, not a monopoly. Instead you have an, a few healthcare providers competing to provide for customer service, right? That would drive competition, lower prices, and create a positive innovations in healthcare due to hospitals staying competitive, right? The second regulation would cap the operating profits of what would be these now allowed dominant market players or oligopolies at say 8% a year compared to the current average of about 12%. This could be done in the form of consent decrees in which the regulators allow that oligopolies to exist under a specific set of conditions, such as this profit cap. That would be forced prices down. Better yet, an excess profits pool would be created. Those making higher profits would have to contribute the difference to struggling hospitals in small markets, such as rural areas. So they limit the amount of profit a hospital can make. In this way, you prevent hospitals from becoming like mega corporations, and then they'll get lazy, and it won't stay so competitive. Maybe they'll receive so much profit, they'll start maybe like buying out competition and things like that. There's a possibility that that would lead to corruption. So limit the amount of operating profit a hospital can make, have it so a hospital can you know, operate comfortably, but don't have them have access funds. Force hospitals to use access funds to help struggling marketplaces. A third regulation would prevent hospital finance people from playing games with that profit limit by raising salaries and bonuses for themselves and their colleagues, thereby raising costs and lowering profits. Basically, no unnecessary bonuses or raises for no reason. A fourth regulation will require a streamlined appeals process staffed by advocates and ombudsmen for patients who believe adequate care has been denied them, or for doctors who claim they are being unduly pressured to skip on care. That makes sense. Have a ability to protest if you got, if you're working under bad conditions, if you're a healthcare worker, or if you have bad treatment, be able to, to protest against that, get some sort of appeal going on. A fifth regulation would require that any government sanctioned oligopoly, the designated integrated system had to have as its actual chief executive, not just in title, a licensed physician who had practiced medicine for a minimum number of years. So the person in charge of these healthcare systems that are being both the provider of healthcare and the insurer, these, these people in charge would need, all, they have to be physicians themselves. They can't just be businessmen who don't, who haven't studied medicine right, and not practice medicine. This keeps it so healthcare is the first priority, right? Instead of business, making money, instead of that being the first priority, it's actually providing the healthcare. Six, any sanctioned integrated oligopoly provider would be required to insure a certain percentage of Medicaid patients at a stipulated discount. And that leads into his final regulation that he proposes. These regulated oligopolies would be required to charge any uninsured patients no more than they charge any competing insurance companies whose insurance they accept or a price based on their regulated profit margin if they don't accept other insurance. 
the point of the regulations is to keep healthcare the number one concern, right? Because right now, the healthcare system, what is it about? <laughs> it's about making money first and foremost. And then providing healthcare is second to that, right? Which is, you know, which is what's wrong with the healthcare system now. Put caregiving as the number one central focus. I often have discussions with people who don't believe that the government should regulate. You know, they, they're hugely against it, right? But the, health, the current healthcare system actually is a perfect example of when we don't have regulations, how such an important system can be broken. <laughs> because when a lot of money is involved, you gotta keep things in check <laughs> because a lot of people aren't the most morally or ethically driven when it comes to billions of dollars being made. There needs to be some form of regulation to help control the system, keep the center focused, benefiting as much people as possible rather than benefiting certain people and then other people just getting the shaft, right? Stephen Brill actually ends the book on a bittersweet note. He talks about the idea of healthcare as a business. Check out this quote. When it comes to our health, we don't care about cost benefit analysis. We care only about maximizing the profit. Suppose you're shopping for a car, a consumer report convinces you that in terms of reliability, safety, and everything else, the Chrysler model you are considering is 90% as good as the Ford you are also looking at. Suppose also that the Chrysler costs only 60% as much as the Ford. You will likely buy the Chrysler. But what if your surgeon told you that one type of patch he was going to use on your aorta was 90% as good as another, but costs only 60% as much? Which one would you choose? Obviously the costlier model. No amount of savings is worth a 10% discount on your life. And that analogy assumes that you have as much information about the comparative effectiveness of medical treatments and devices as you do about cars, which you don't. It also assumes that you will believe what the cheaper product is almost as good or just as good, which when it comes to medical care, you either won't believe or you'll be scared enough not to take the chance. So this goes to the previous discussion about regulations. See, right now, healthcare is, is like it's a profit-making, big money business. And the system overall, the primary focus is about making money. Now that works in a lot of business industries, like maybe like the, the smartphone industry or the car industry, what he's talking about. That type of competitiveness, that type of way of treating a system works well. But in healthcare, that doesn't work because lives are at stake. So it's not the same. We're applying these business strategies to a part of our lives that shouldn't be looked at in that way. All of these issues related to scarce resources are only going to intensify. That's true here and around the world because of a catch-22 about the advances in medical care. These advances will generally mean that everyone lives longer with older populations everywhere. Every country's healthcare needs and expenses as a percent of their overall economy are destined to rise. Compared to the rest of the world, the United States is staring into the future from a ditch. We already spend 50 to 100% more as a portion of our gross domestic product on healthcare than our competitors do. Obamacare is not likely to change that. Indeed, by making the deals he made, by making the right tragic choice and giving healthcare to people like that family I talked about before, Barack Obama likely dug us, us deeper into the ditch. The best prospect for digging us out is that now that we have paid the ransom the industry demanded in Washington to get coverage, perhaps the resulting sticker shock exacerbated by the renegades like the markets will cause us to demand real change on the cost side too. You might not like the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, right? You might not like it, but at least the problem of healthcare, the, how, how broken our system is, our healthcare system is, it's on the center stage. At least as we're, we're talking about it. And that's the key to solving this problem, right? Us as citizens, we have to do something about it. We have to not only just talk about it, we have to act. We need to continue to discuss about this issue and also you know, critique policies like the Affordable Care Act and critique alternatives as well. And the start is educating yourself. Many people don't know jack squat about actually how the healthcare system works and the laws that are involved in the policies and the economics and the politics. And that's the first step, educate yourself on the system. 
And this is a great resource. America's Bitter Pill by Stephen Brill is a great resource to help you educate yourself on the controversy that's going on in America about health care. So if you want to know about that, whether you're an American who's clueless about that or you're from some other country who doesn't understand why, what's the big deal about health care, check this book out. You'll do yourself a favor because you'll educate yourself. And knowledge is power. Well, this is the Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more philosophical thoughts.